And today I have with me author, and has many names, but author today, Marsha Butler. And this is Marsha's first book, The Skin Above My Knee. Marsha. <laughs> I have no words. I, I'm like, all night long I was stressing about this interview because you... And I have lived such parallel lives and the things you said, you put words to my life, which is why people write memoirs, is to put words to other people's lives so you don't feel so alone in this world. And you did that. And I am so grateful. Oh, um, Michelle, it's, it's a thrill to, talk, to speak with you today. And, you know, that's, a, that's an author's dream is just, you know, to speak with people who say, you told my story, you said the words that I maybe had not imagined saying. So thank you for that. It's a huge compliment, and I'm really honored. Thank you. Well, okay, I, you know, I want to tell everybody, I mean, not only are you an author, and you are an amazing author, it, 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 I cannot believe that you have never written another book besides this. Like, you write so beautifully, okay? Like, it was thank just, and, and I listened to the audiobook also. I went back and forth, and wow. I didn't even have to look to see if it was you. I knew it was you because I listen to so many audiobooks that I can tell whether it's them talking because they're so invested in every word and you know they lived it and I knew you lived it and then I looked and I was like I knew it I knew she did the narration so but um yeah and I so last night I'm laying in bed I'm like okay where am I gonna start where am I gonna start this woman has lived my life I did not know anybody else lived my life but I realize, like, the thing that you bring out the most in this memoir, which just, and there's so much to it, but it's the lies we tell ourselves, okay? I I didn't even realize, you know, like, there's this, um, you know, when people ask me, I'm now 52, both my parents are gone, okay? And if somebody says, oh, how was your relationship with your mom? Great. Perfect. It was great. It was a mother-daughter relationship. It, you know, it's not the truth. It, was, it wasn't the truth at all, like, you know, but you have these, like, answers, you know, like, with, how was your dad? Oh, he was an awesome person. Um, he sexually molested me since I was two, but he was an amazing guy. Let me tell you, everybody loved him. <laughs> like, you know, and it's crazy, you know, it's, cr it's crazy, it is absolutely crazy. Absolutely. Yeah, crazy. yeah it's interesting that you're saying that, and it is true, we, we have the truth that we tell ourselves. Um, that we know within ourselves, that we might not even be, tell, be able to tell ourselves, but we know somewhere inside what the truth is about our lives, our relationships with our parents and our families. And, you know, everybody's got a story. There's no, there's not a relationship on earth that is not complex in some way. Some are more devastating than others. Some are, are unbelievably tragic. It sounds like you've had a very challenging relationship with your mother and father. And, you know, so I think what self-protection does really in the young child and then through a young girl's life and into adult life is, is that we find the story that is easiest to tell to the outside world because you can't let that out. It's not appropriate most times. It's not the conversation that you want to be having most times until you're able to have the conversation with yourself and with the people, hopefully, maybe, that it, it, that it is engaging, engaged with, such as your parents. So I think, it's a, I think it's a normal thing for people to hold this information back and tell another kind of story. It's not a lie, really, but it's a, it's a, a non-truth, you know? So that's what I did also in my, in my, in my life. And, in, and I revealed it in my book. I hadn't told you many people at all. Right. And I love that you were so, on, you were so brutally honest that I was cringing. Okay. Because I, people would say to me, you know, um, you should write your memoir and, you know, you should write, I know you've experienced some things you should. And I used to be like, Oh my God, I don't even know, how do you write that down? Like, I don't even know how you, and you know, when I was reading your book, I was like, I guess you just write it down. Like, I guess it, it did it help you to write it down? Like, did, was it healing for you? Yes, it was healing for me. Um, however, I think I'm still working that out, actually. Um, 
I had not told 98% of the, the events in my book to anyone, right. including shrinks, right? Um, so I was always holding back, always holding back, always holding back. And this is the way I was able to manage to have a successful life in music, right? right. Because I was keeping the two lives separate. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are ready to tell their story and this sounds banal, but only when they're ready to tell it. It could be, you know, at age 30. But for me, I'm 62. So I started writing this um, about six or seven years ago. And um, I wrote it for about four years. I really wasn't thinking at the time when I started writing it, okay, now I'm going to get it out. Now I'm going to tell this story. It really was a manifestation of talking about my life as a musician, and somehow I think intuitively that I realized I could not talk about my life as, as a musician without weaving that underbelly of narr narrative into it. And I did it instinctively at first, and then once I really, really realized that I grappled with the idea that, you know, wow, this is a memoir. So that galvanized me, and I just kept writing. So it felt, in the four years, it felt like an imperative, actually, that I was not in charge of, mm -hmm. that I just kept writing it. And I just realized that it was a book. I felt like I would self-publish it at one point, and then I was lucky enough to get an agent and to sell it quickly. But this is, I, I, I see life and creativity and what we do in life, and I think our life story is part of everyone's creativity as a continuum a continuum of growing and living. And for me, it wasn't time to tell the story, to say the truth, to speak what my truth was until the minute that I started writing it. And once I started writing it, that was like the pinhole that was opened. And then it just opened up and I wrote it. That's how it felt for me. Mm -hmm. Kind of like um, exploring a piece of Mozart and not really un really understanding it and practicing and practicing it. And then you're finally really ready to bring it on stage and perform it for the world. I mean, if I can use that metaphor. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Well, and what I love about you is that you were able to do that, though. You could separate your life out into your being very successful and then also that, you know, the, the yucky family stuff. And, you know, I don't know that I was that successful with it. I don't know that I have been that success, successful with it. I don't, and, and then that kind of makes me angry at them. Like that's the only anger I have left over is that I feel like it's only, they're gone, <laughs> like, you know, like they are gone. Okay, right. so it's like why, you know, some days I think, why do I still think about them? You know, why do you still think? But I, I admire the fact that you could do that. You could compartmentalize those two things and become this very successful. And and uh, and maybe it really helped you to be able to focus into something and then be able to not think about the other stuff, you know? Yes, yes absolutely. And, you know, so two things. Um, um, I think that because I compartmentalized I was able to do what I had to do in music. However, you know, as a and become a successful musician. However, really music was the mechanism by which I actually saved myself, mm -hmm. right? Right. And um and it kept and so can I say that it, it's the ideal way to live not really. So vis-a-vis -vis you and your experience um, you kept those lives closer together. So the reality of what you experienced as, as, as a young person and the struggles in managing that and negotiating that throughout your life touched into your, your then adult life more than mine did, you know? So I don't think one way is better than the other way. I just think it is how we are as people and the, the vast bandwidth that we have as ind individuals to manage our stuff. Now, I did it one way, you did it another way. I think, though, I think at the end of the day, it, it might be helpful to just accept the way it showed up in your life. Mm -hmm. And if it had showed up, shown up in another way, you may not have had your daughter, you may not have had your son. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. And, 
Well, yeah, of course I go there. But that's how you live, right? I mean, otherwise you yeah. wouldn't be able to. You have to look and pick out the good pieces and, you know, kind of put the – I had six children, okay? So oh, Oh my goodness. Oh my God bless you. So I was busy in that respect, but it doesn't feel like I wanted, it's, it's really weird. You know, when you're a little kid and you, you think about what you want to do, I wanted to be more like you, not necessarily in music because I wasn't gifted in music, but I wanted to do something. I had this like vision of this thing and, and instead I went the completely different way. I became this housewife and mom and, you know, and that was what I did for a my son's going to be 30 and my youngest is 14. So I'm still doing it. And, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's almost like that took me, but I have to say that I was scared to have daughters because of my mom and I relationship. Yeah, I was scared yeah. to become her and that I only have two daughters, but you know, to, and that's still, they're in their twenties and it still haunts me. You know, like I, I back right. away a lot, you know, than my mom did. <laughs> right. I, and I feel I did not have children and, um, I do, I, I think I had this idea that I I perhaps would not be able to be a good mother. I mean, that just because of the relationship that I had with my mother, because my mother was so profoundly distancing, and I didn't have a role model, you know, as, as a mother that was nurturing and interested, and my mother was not that at all. Right. So, you know, it plays out the way it plays out. And, uh, yes, regrets. We've had a few, um, <laughs> uh, you mentioned, and <laughs> if I may quote Frank Sinatra, but you know, it's, you know, I think women struggle mightily with relationship with mother always. And, um, I know only a few people in my life who've had like glowing, just amazing relationship with their, with their mother. Me too. And I, I always watch them like, wow, you know, they're like, I love my, you know, I have a friend who's like, love my mom so much. And they talk every day. I'm like, we talk, my mom and I talk, but it was, it was bad. It wasn't a good, it wasn't a good situation. But what you said in here hit me so hard. Um, I was actually listening to it on the way home last night. And you said, uh, when your mom died, right? Like, and I had the same order. My dad died in 1988. He died a long time ago. And then it was just me and my mom and my brother. And we had that little triangle. But when my mom died, everybody was kind of like, well, how do you feel? And I was like, I don't know. Like, and then after a while, when you said that, it was like a relief. I was like, oh, it is, like, I do feel free from her. Her grip of, it was a grip kind of. And it was like, when she was gone, it was gone. But it was freeing then I could be the mom that I would yes. that, you know, I've gotten to be the mom that I wanted to be without her in the picture now for five years, you know? Yes. Yes. So, yeah. It's, yeah. I just, yeah. When you said, I, that's why I said it's so important when you say, because you hit people like, it's like, it's not me. It's not just me. Like I'm not the one, you know, I was like, oh my God, somebody else feels that. Like I felt that. And I, I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell anybody that's how I felt because everybody wants you to be devastated and they want you to, you know, I don't know. Right. It's, it's true. It's true. And, um, I guess I expected myself to feel more, but I really did not. Right. Uh, uh, and you know, and, and you see people lose close family members and you observe that they've had a complex relationship there. You know, for instance, uh, the, you know, a, a woman that is constantly fighting with her mother and had a bad relationship, the mother passes on and you see them grieving greatly, you know, and you think, well, wow, I just thought they had a sort of a bad relationship. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was their crappy mother, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and, you know, they love their, you know, they, but that wasn't the case for me. You know, I, my mother and father kind of, uh, you know, banished me from the family for the last, uh, you know, almost 20 years, really. And um, I had a long time to negotiate that and to be alone in the world, really. Yes. Uh, yes. And that was yes. it's something that just I got used to and I came to peace with, really. I mean, you know, I mean, things still hurt, but not nearly as much. And it, and to go back to your, your, your point about the book being a... Um, a catharsis. I mean, it has been because even though it's hard, it's still hard to understand that people I know know my story and they didn't know it before. 
people that I don't know know my story, and they, of course, didn't know it. Um, at least I have told some truths, and that feels good because I was not before, and that feels good to me. So no regrets on it, eh? That, that's awesome. And um, that's what I mean. You were so truthful about all your past relationships that I don't even know where mine are. Like, and I was thinking, well, maybe eventually, like, I'm still mom. I'm a single mom now. And I'm still doing that. So in a way, I'm still like, I don't sit around and think about it a lot. But um, the one the other thing that yeah, there's so much. <laughs> that's what I said. We have so you have no idea, like, uh, as I'm going through my head. Um, I really related to you on the suicides, okay, and you're younger. It's really weird, and I don't know whether it's something that, you know, maybe some therapist would tell us that that's a normal thing. My dad used to try to commit suicide in front of us all the time. He would take a bottle of Valium and dump them, okay? So suicide, now, I, is that a serious suicide? No, it's not, because because he did it in front of people who called the 911, and, you know, yeah. so that's not serious. But I know my brother, who's um, a year and a half younger than me, as we became adults, like, it's weird how suicide becomes part of your thinking. Like, things aren't going well. I don't know how. All right. I, I don't need to be here. You know, I can't deal with that. It's amazing. And then I always felt like I couldn't say that out loud. Like, or, or I'm like, does everybody think that? Or is that just, I don't even know. I don't even know if everybody thinks that. But when you said it in your book, I was like, well, maybe it's normal or maybe it's not normal. I don't know, you know? Well, I think um, for myself, there uh, I've always had this tremendous existential struggle. As, as, I, as I talk about and write about in my book, this kind of, you know, why am I here even? This has always been a lifelong thing from the minute I can remember thinking. It's kind of like, well, why, why am I here? And is it good to be here? And so I think I came out of the womb that way to a certain extent. And I think there are people who struggle with that. Um, some might call it some, you know, just an ongoing kind of mental illness, so to speak, you know, uh, low level mental illness uh, kind of thing. But, right. and I've continued to struggle with suicidal ideation. Um, in, uh, I had the two events that I talk about in my book, which is one where I tried to throw myself in front of a car uh, when I was young. And then also when I was young, when I walked into Central Park four consecutive evenings, <laughs> hope, you know, I mean, we laugh. Yes. <laughs> I know. It's, I'm um, sorry. It was, but when I was reading it, I was like, I never thought of that. <laughs> like, that was pretty creative. <laughs> well, you know, in the, uh, yeah. So for four consecutive nights, I walked in deep into Central Park during the 1970s where it was. Well, you're like, come on, people are murdered here. <laughs> right. Right. You know, murder bait. Yeah. Just kind of hoping for someone to do some damage to me. And it didn't work out in both cases, but um, I continue to feel those thoughts, you know, I, they continue to wash over me, uh, to this day. I now it's not something that I'm actually going to act on. And I have learned how to negotiate that kind of thing. Okay. It's a thought. It's a feeling. It's not an actionable thought, you know, in myself. So this is just, I think that when people are set up in life, with a mindset and also situations which lead them to think, I don't want to be here. You know, when certain act things are happening in their life where they feel, bring me away anywhere, like get me out of this situation. It is too much to bear, such as you experienced, such as I experienced in my early childhood and on ongoing through my, my adolescence. Um, you know, it's an escape valve. It's an option. It becomes an option in the mind to really think, well, I can get out of here. I can jump off a building. I can jump in front of a car. I can stop this right now. And just to think the thought that there's an option out there that is a release, sometimes that's enough. So I mean, don't you think it's more of a control because we had so little control? I always looked at it as kind of um, my own little control thing. Like, because yes. as children, we had no control over any of our situations, okay? We couldn't make yes. them behave like we wanted them to. We couldn't get the love we wanted. So it was like in our brains somehow, it's like, well, I have control. You know, I have control whether I'm here or not. You can't. You can't control that. You know, I can control right. that. 
Yes, it's the ultimate control. And another another young woman might go to anorexia, which is control right. over the body. Right. Or or, um, or 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 eat too much, yes. which is another way to control the body. Right. You right. know, to be you know to render themselves. Um, the young girl rendered themselves unattractive to others, just protect themselves or stop eating, which is to bring your shrink yourself down to nothing or say, I can get out of this right now by throwing myself in front of the car. Right. And, and um, there's nothing you can do about it. Basically. Yeah, you know, it is. It's, it's the ultimate control. Right. We can ultimately control ourselves to not get help, not walk away, but to die. And, you know, so yeah, it is control. But I then, suppose. you know, when you were faced with breast cancer, you fought for your life. I did. And I, I, hmm. Yeah. So I guess when, <laughs> I guess what that is, is that at the end, at the end of it all, I can say that I, I guess I don't want to die. I want to get myself out of the situation, but I don't want to die, which is why I'm still here. Right. Um, yeah, I did fight. I fought. And was numb along the whole way of that as well. I mean, um, and angry in a way, which, and angry because when I was, during my breast cancer, I was, did not get the support from my parents that I, or my, my sister that I had expected and wanted and was kind of, kind of happy that I got breast cancer because I thought, oh, now I'm going to, now I'm going to get them. You know, now they're going to come to me. And they did. Yeah. So, you know, that was also... I didn't also realize they were still alive, actually, during your breast cancer. I didn't realize they were... Well, you know, I think I do remember now you saying, like, you were thinking that it was going to bring your mom, you know... Right. Like, yeah. That. They is were. Your, they were doing that. Is your sister still alive? No, she passed away two and a half years ago. Oh, okay. That was another question. I, I just wondered, you know, when I was reading it, because you yeah. really addressed it. Yeah. She, she passed away. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, so the good parts, you know, like of the book, my takeaway and, and why this is such an amazing book for people to, to read is that, um, so, you know, I have six children and, and um, they're all trying out there trying to accomplish things in their lives and different, different scenarios. But I have a son who's a golfer right now. He's in high school and, you know, he's struggling with trying to be the best. And I said, well... I'm reading a book right now about a woman who, you know, on Friday and Saturday nights when her friends were going out, you know, she was at home making reads for her oboe and, you know, practicing however many hours a day you practice. And, and so as a master of something so significant and, and not everybody is, and not everybody does, like, did you know what it was going to take? I mean, was it this driving force in you? Like, I know, you know, like I want to be the best. I want to, you know, this is what I want to do. So it wasn't a hardship. It wasn't like you were like somebody was forcing you to practice the amount of hours you practiced. Right. I mean, you did that all on your own. Yes, it's true. And so, um, it's not honestly, Michelle, that I wanted to be the best. I wanted to, uh, what I think I was striving for was that I was, Putting myself, myself in a world of music, of great art, from a very young age, mm -hmm. and I understood that this was um, this was a world and an art form that was much bigger than me, and that I was only a very small part in it, but that it was a profound um, uh, experience and privilege to do that. So I wanted to contribute. And this is all something that I wasn't thinking consciously along the way, but this is what I assess from the long lens of being the age that I am. And I can look back right. that I understood that that music is another form of love and that in order to embody and to be in that that realm of exalted love that music gives everyone in the world, everyone is is everyone is Im impacted by music. And everyone experiences it as love, really. You know, it's a connection from the music to the performer to the listener. This is a this is like a, a profound connection between people. So I understood on an intuitive level that this is what I was going to engage in. And it wasn't that I wanted to be the best, but I wanted to be the best that I could be so that I could I could enter that world in the best way that I could so that I could get as much from it 
and give as much as I could to others through it, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And so I, that was my, and that's what I endeavored to do every single day. And I realized early on that the way to do that is to just be on it every day and be practicing every day and making reads every day and studying as much as I could and being open to this ephemeral art form. And this, th these are a lot of words that I'm applying onto my experience, but I think it was an imperative that I grabbed onto. And to relate it to your son, uh, being in the world of golf, which is, uh, of, is as many people know, is not a, it's not an art form that is just physical. It's a mental sport. Totally, it's a head game. Mm -hmm. you're, you're battling against yourself. Yes, you've got to beat the other guy. You have to be under par. You have to do all that sort, sort of thing. But there's not a person in the world that, who's looked at golf or has heard golfers talk. It's here. It is a, a mental head game, and that is a very profound thing to, to go into. And so, you know, yes, you have to get your physical stuff down, just like on the oboe, you have to be able to play perfectly as much as possible. But then be, being a great golfer, you also have to step into the head game of it. So it's sort of similar in a way, you know, and um, you're only battling yourself. Yeah, I think mastering anything of that, because if you, I mean, I felt like in the book when you would talk about the times that you'd have to go play when things weren't so good, you know, and you're going on in your life, like you would have to like step into like clear, didn't you have to like clear it out and be like, all right, I'm going to go play now. And the good thing about it was what I was thinking is that, and I don't know because I don't play an instrument, so you can tell me, but I would think that when you are doing that, you are not do thinking about other things. Like, you know. Well, yes, to a certain extent, yes. It's like, you, it's, but what I can say is, is that when you step in to play a concert um, and things are not going well, and, you know, there's not a musician in the world that hasn't played a concert, like, a lot, where there's a whole, you know, there's a whole slew of stuff happening behind them. Family, kids, husband, the world, you know, I mean, you step out on stage and you basically wrap yourself up in this, this sound world. And what it is really is, is that you are being propelled to do that, not so much by your own ego or about what you can bring to the table on the stage, but the, it's, it's really about what, the, the privilege of taking a composer in your hand, mm -hmm. it, you know, there's these great artists, Mozart, Beethoven, I use those generically, but right. all, the, all the composers that have written for this realm of music, of classical music that I was involved with for so many years, is, is that that is your job, is to recreate um, this music, this one time on a concert, in a concert hall, on stage for listeners. And that you have to take very seriously as a profound imperative. And you can't go on there and just on the stage and just say, well, I'm just gonna phone it in, you know, because I'm having problems, you know, I'm having a hard time. Um, you have to really be able to focus in because it is a great art form. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I, I brought, I tried to bring to the table at, in each concert, you know, uh, in spite of everything else. And I think most musicians who are serious, you know, even musicians, uh, the rock, rock stars, you know, uh, pop artists, when they're on stage, it's serious stuff. And you want to be able to, you know, give, give your everything to the, to, the, to the listener. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Right. You know? I'm, I'm listening to, I was listening to Phil Collins' book, you know, from Genesis. And mm -hmm. he, after he got done with Genesis, he started playing for Quincy Jones for a tour, right? And yeah. he said, and I, I got, found this in your book. It's kind of funny. That's why I brought it up is that he said that when he were, they were done with the show, Quincy came over to him and he was like, you missed two things, you know, work on it or something. He was like, how did he hear that? How did he know? Yeah. Because Phil yeah. Collins was always in a band. Nobody was listening to his, you know, every note or whatever and he made it like it was he was so like and you know but you talk about 
how the, the, the conductors, like they know they can hear it all and they know when you've met, messed up and maybe nobody else knows, but they, you know, how do they, how do they get all these instruments and then they can hear like something is off. You know, it's like, it's crazy to have that kind of an ear. Yeah. Yes. And so that's one of the great things about being in, in the music world is, is that there are those exceptional musicians who, for instance, the rare conductor, and there aren't that many of them. And I talk about, uh, I write about one of them in the book, um, who, um, were on stage were playing a Mahler symphony and there's, you know, maybe 80 people on stage and the sound is massive and loud and he can hear that the horn part is wrong. And, you know, you just, uh, you know, these are, these are people with exceptional gifts. They, they can hear that. And it's just, and, you know, you just scratch your head and say, wow, I didn't hear that, you know, and that's why the guy's standing on the podium and you're not. <laughs> He's supposed to know that. He's supposed to be the interpreter and, and guiding us through a big symphony, you know, and ha having the depth of understanding of a Mahler symphony that I don't have. I mean, you know, I understand the piece, but, and I know my part and I'm listening like crazy, but I don't have his drop down understanding of, of, you know, what Mahler really means to say during this symphony. So yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, it was a great, it's a great art form. You oh, know, I, I, I love, just was so lucky. I love that you put so much of it in this book because those two, that to me was like, you know, the, the book has these, you know, dips and then you have the high points and then it's dip. But to me, the high points were when you talked about your music, because I could, I could hear it in the audio book. I could hear your love for it. I was, I, I so admired you for it. And I was like, wow, what would that be like? I don't even know what that would be like, you know, and to be that accomplished and the things you were doing with it and, and taking us through your career. I love that part of the book. I mean, that was just amazing. So Oh, thanks. And I, you know, I think it's, it, it, um, I think it was, I felt intuitively that it was needed because the narrative, you know, the, the personal story narrative is, is tough. You know, it's not easy to read. It's not, it's not a happy story. Um, uh, but, um, the music parts, you know, it just, I just wanted to, I did, I did have great, great times during that time as a musician. I mean, it was just, you know, it was, it's what you live for is to be on stage. So, you know, I wanted to bring that to the, to the reader as well. Yeah. And I loved stepping into your shoes. You know, you did Your writing was so well that I felt like I was in your shoes when you were, you know, I felt like I, Oh, is that what it's like? You know, it's like, Oh, is that what it's like to, to, you know, sub in for a Broadway show and to be in the, you know, like for, for me, it's like that. I can't even picture what that would be like, but you let me into your world of like what that felt like, you know, to get those phone calls and, and to get, you know, to be allowed to, to play the way you were all over the place and, you know, how exciting it was. And you know, I love that part of the book, but I have, I have one like really important question, not important, but yes, last yes. it's like, okay, so you go in the book about the making of those reads. Okay? Yes. And I was, so I was trying to explain this to my son, you know, and he played some instruments as a, as a younger child, but I was trying to, cause he's like the oboe, you know, and I was explaining, cause a lot of people say that. And I'm sure you get that like all the time, like the, you play the oboe, like, what is that? What does that instrument, instrument look like? You know? Right. <laughs> So how, what is the process? Like it is complicated. You went into it a little bit, but I wanted to hear from you. Like, how do you make those? Why is it such a long okay. process? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so starting off, the oboe is a, a woodwind instrument, which looks sort of, it's similar in size to the clarinet, but it has nothing to do with the clarinet. <laughs> little reed that you put in the top and professional oboe players literally make the reed and we make them all day every day we make them constantly they wear out so basically you have a little brass tube right you get the cane sent a tube cane which is basically bamboo from france it comes over in a box and there's like maybe 200 stalks about that long you cut them slice them down lengthwise so that there are three of them and you gouge out the middle of them with a with a precision machine you soak it in water first and then you chop them to about this size and length and then you fold them over and you shake down the contour and then you put it on this tube you tie it around with nylon thread and that's called a blank then you take a really sharp razor knife 
knife and you scrape down this bark on the on the piece of bamboo both sides you clip open the top and scrape it down more and you get it to the point where you blow into it and it makes a sound okay so those two sides are flapping together with the air that you're blowing into it and that's an art that's the artistry is where you have to make it so that it gives you the sound that it plays really well you put it into the oboe and you test it and then you re re rejigger it and it's hell which is the name of the chapter <laughs> of the bead making chapter and um all i can say is you can youtube making an oboe read and there's probably a lot of youtubes out there of oboists showing in like 10 minutes how to make a read right and so anybody who's interested in how to make an oboe read yeah they can go they can go on on youtube and look at that um but this is all to say that these reads wear out quickly and we play a lot. We practice a lot. We play rehearsals all day. We play concerts several nights a week and those reads don't last long and sometimes they're not perfect. So you have to, what I did was I started to read every single day. So every day for 25 years, basically 27 years, however long I was doing it, I would be starting to read, you know, every day with the except, very little exception. And because you have to get them on an assembly line. So as they're wearing out, the new ones are coming. So you're constantly on a factory, you know, and a factory line of getting the reeds cut because you have to break them in and then you play them in rehearsal and then you decide whether they're going to be good enough for the performance. Sometimes you play concerts on reeds that you don't like and are not as good. So for 25, 27 years, I was making, basically making reeds almost every day of my life. And that is something that not any other musician does. That's what I was good. That was my next question. Is there anybody no else? No one else does this. So it would be equivalent of, say, a violinist having to make a bow every day. Or, you know, clarinetists do manipulate their reeds um, with a reed knife, but they basically buy them out of a box. Bassoon players do it as well. Bassoon players do what oboists do. But that's a bigger read, and it actually, they would hate me to say this the soonest, but I will say that it is generally understood that it is easier to make a bassoon read than it is to make a oboe read, and they last longer because they are bigger. So, okay, so kill me all bassoonists. <laughs> I'm sorry I said it, but it's true. But, you know, the other part about it is that, Michelle, in an, in an orchestra, the oboist is the premier voice in the wind section and, if I may say, the orchestra. So it tunes the orchestra. And it, many, many solo instruments, the flute and the bassoon and the clarinet and the French horn and the trumpet, they have solos within orchestral pieces. But the oboist is a very special sound in the orchestra. And the oboist determines really the quality of sound that the that the wind section is going to have. They're kind of the leader, mentally, spiritually, sound-wise, um, musically, of the wind section. The principal oboist is the most important wind player in the section. Wow. I humbly say. Wow. Now, others may disagree, but <laughs> really, if you, ha you have to have a phenomenal oboist in, in the wind section, and that kind of guides the whole sort of gestalt of what's going on in the orchestra. And so it's a huge chair. It's a big chair. It's an important chair. It is a chair. You cannot, you can't step off it. It is there. You're, you're the, you are really leading a lot in the, in the orchestra. Wow. And therefore it's important to have a good read. <laughs> you know, while I'm reading this in the book, I'm like, isn't you're in New York city. Isn't that there an oboe read store somewhere? <laughs> No, no, the answer is no, not, not in any way, shape, or form, oh my goodness. So from box to using it, what's the time frame? Box? Oh, you mean from the tube cane? Oh my God. I mean, from getting it in your, in your mail to yeah. it's usable, you know, from all the process that you do to it. How many days? Oh, well, once you cut it down and put it on the tube, I mean... You can make it in two days, you know, because I like to wait a day because when you let it dry out and you soak it up again, it changes. Oh. And then you can play it, 
you know, so maybe if it's a really good piece of cane and you made it well and it was a great read, you could play it. I mean, you're always playing a lot of different reads at once because you never just stick one read on and play it for the oh. week. That's not good because you want to save them, save them. You want to have working up. You're playing several reads at a time always yeah. because you don't want to wear them out. You want to sort of, you know, just like when you're working with five reads, you know, you're just so um, I would say they last, you know, they would go maybe for two concerts and then, you know, and then I put them in a box for Broadway shows, basically, because Broadway shows, you're playing into a mic and it's, you know, it's not like playing in an orchestra, you know, so the reads that are kind of worn out will do well for Broadway shows uh, very well. And you can sound great on them, um, but they're not for Carnegie Hall, you know, that sort of thing. So that's I wondered what it was like playing for um, Broadway musicals, because I love Broadway musicals. But, you know, is that... Um is it entertaining in its own different way being in the, in the orchestra pit and watching, or, or do you even get to, I, I don't know. No, no, we're under the stage. You can't oh, sit under the stage. I thought there was, there was a place like around you're under the stage. Underneath oh, the yeah. stage in the orchestra pit. I'm so we never could see, we would never see that, but you know, playing a Broadway show is a different kind of artistry. And, um, I talk, I write about it in my book. Um, you know, basically, um, you need to play ex sort of exactly the same every night. You don't want to change what you're doing. The artistic team needs everything on the show. And this is true for the actors as well. Right. They, they sing the same way. And this is not to say that that's bad. They want this Broadway show is a product for the audience. And it's a product that they're doing eight shows a week, right? And so it really has – what someone hears on Monday night pretty much has to be what the next person hears on Wednesday night. Right. And there's artistry in be, being able to do that and bring it to such a high level every single night. So I would say that um, it, was, it, it was wonderful. I didn't mind playing Broadway shows at all. And what I can say is that in the Broadway community – the um, the talent pool is phenomenal on stage and in the pit. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I, I occasionally go to Broadway shows still, and I just saw Groundhog Day, and, um, I mean, it's astonishing. The, the talent is incredible in Broadway theater. It's, it's just amazing. I know. I always that, think that, too. Yeah, I just, like, I have the highest respect for the musicians and the performers, but it's a different thing. You don't, you, you know, you want it to be the same. You want it to feel and sound and, and, and look the same every night. So it's kind of a factory job on that level, but not really because you have to be completely aware all the time. Right. You know, so it's great. It's great. It was, it was good to do it. I loved it. Right. And you've now retired from playing the oboe. Yeah. Yes. I retired in 2008. I played my last concert. Yeah. Yeah. Do you miss and it? Not at all. No? No. <laughs> I, I don't. I, you know, I go to a lot of opera. I listen. I, I really was ready to do it because, um, you know, I had become an interior designer during a lot of that time. And uh, so I had that other career uh, and it felt the creative I felt like it was just being funneled into another place. And I did that for a while. And then I stopped that at last October. So now I'm just writing. Oh, but awesome. I don't miss it. I don't, you know, I don't go to Carnegie Hall and hear some mobile player play a big solo and go, oh, I wish I was there. No. You know, I really, I, I did my thing. I was very, um, I was okay giving it up. That's it was awesome. ready. Yeah. Well, and you are writing a novel right now, right? I actually finished the novel and it's out for sale right now. And now I'm working on uh, the concept of my next nonfiction book. You mean, is it on Amazon? No, 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 it's out for sale. Oh, out for sale. Oh, okay. I was like, wait a second. I didn't yeah. see it out there. Okay, awesome. I'm so, I mean, like I said before, it's amazing to me how talented of a person. I mean, you had the music, but your writing is truly, I mean, it's poetic. It's, 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 
it's out of this world. It kept me riveted. Okay. And I, and I thank you for writing it because I feel today a little bit more normal than I felt yesterday or the day before, <laughs> you know, and, and that's, and that's what's awesome about memoirs. And I know I'm not the only one. I know there are many people that you're going to touch with this book and, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Well, it's a thrill that you read it. It's a thrill to be here. What an engaging conversation I've had with you. I just feel like, you know, wow, this is this has been a great uh, broadcast. And, awesome. you know, I do hope, you know, the book is the skin above my knee, and I'm really hoping that people hear this and, and read it and that they'll be touched. And anyone can always reach out to me on my website, MarshaButlerAuthor.com. I all your links. Everybody can yeah, find you. I have all your links. And I was going to ask you about the title, and then I was like, nope, let people read it. Let them find out why you named it this. Yes, I, yeah, I, don't yeah. want to, I don't want to give it away because I was wondering through most of the book, I was like, and then you get to it, and it's like, it's beautiful, and I want other people to experience it the way that I did. So I'm not going to, well, I'm not going to say. So everybody, yeah. this is the book, and thank you so much, Marsha. And I can't wait. When that novel comes out, we can chat again because I will be reading it. I love that. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.